So can you hear me? Well, um, I would like to thank the um, other organizers for uh, having uh, started the organization. I, I was contacted at, uh, at a later stage, and I, um, I'm happy to be here to have collaborated uh, to this event and also to, uh, to be a speaker here. So um, what I will talk about will um, have... Um, uh, strong connections with the lectures of uh, Huiskan in particular. So I will also talk about mean curvature flow. I will uh, especially talk about the um, formation of singularities, the um, analysis of the profile of the solutions where singularities form, um, mainly for uh, a specific class of hypersurfaces evolving by mean curvature flow that have some um, convexity, more, more or less strong convexity properties. And then I will uh, present some, um, some part of the um, of a previous work with, um, uh, with Gerard Huiskan, where we did um, some years ago a um, surgery procedure for the mean curvature flow. Uh, a way to continue the flow after singularities, which is suitable for uh, topological applications of the flow. So um, before uh, starting uh, talking about some results, uh, I would like to uh, spend some um, word on the background of this uh, theory. Uh, so how did the uh, mean curvature flow came uh, in the interest of mathematicians. Because um, this is something I do not know in detail because I, uh, I'm not that old, but uh, for what I uh, know from the literature. Um, as you have um, already heard in the previous lecture, one um, pioneering work in forming curvature flow is the work by Brackey. In, um, uh, don't remember the exact year, I think it was 74 or something like that. And um, this was um, somehow motivated, um, I guess, it was clearly influenced by what was going on in uh, geometric measure theory, in minimal surface theory. So it So somehow, mean curvature flow can be regarded as uh, the um, uh, evolutionary counterpart of the study of minimal surfaces. Um, and at that time, there were a big theory going on. And um, somehow, Brecky got the inspiration to uh, extend uh, uh, this uh, and to go on in the parabolic uh, part of that. Uh, of the theory. But also, if you read the beginning of Brackett's work, uh, there was some motivation coming from uh, physical models, some um, physical uh, phenomenon where some interface was uh, evolving, and uh, there were maybe some surface tension involved, and this uh, um, creates uh, some term involving the mean curvature. So there were also physical models. In fact, there was already a paper in the, I think in the 50s, by um, a guy named Mullins, uh, who uh, considered uh, in the plane, uh, solutions of the mean curvature flow, self-similar solutions. And he was motivated by a uh, certain phenomenon of metals where some interface uh, was evolving by mean curvature flow. Um, somehow, independently from this, uh, um, there was another uh, line of research which led to mean curvature flow. And uh, it was mentioned by Claudio this morning. There was a paper by Eels uh, and Samson 
uh, again, I'm <laughs> not sure about the exact year. I think it was in the 60s. About harmonic maps. And um, they considered, they, they wanted to show existence of harmonic maps uh, between two given Riemannian manifolds. Their idea was, uh, very roughly speaking, take any map and then uh, let it improve, let, it, let us make it harmonic by using the heat equation. We take an arbitrary map as a starting point for a heat equation. We study the evolution and they were able to prove that under some assumption on the sign of the sectional curvature of the target manifold that um, this heat equation for maps uh, um, has a long time uh, existence and as time goes to infinity, it converges to a, a harmonic map. And um, then um, having this as an inspiration, there was a, a well-known uh, um, spectacular result by Richard Hamilton in the 80s. Who introduced the so-called Ricci flow. Um, this school is a school on extrinsic flows, so flows where the extrinsic curvatures are involved. The Ricci flow instead is an intrinsic flow, is the evolution of the metric of an abstract manifold, therefore we, we will not focus on Ricci flow in this uh, school, but it is worth uh, mentioning it because it, uh, there are connections between Ricci flow and uh, mean curvature flow similarities more than connections, and um, uh, Ricci Flo has provided a motivation and an inspiration for a lot of work of mean curvature, I mean curvature flow. Uh, what I will talk about is largely influenced by work on Ricci Flo. And um, Hamilton proved um, a result in Riemannian geometry, which was this one. He proved that if uh, M3 with some uh, metric G is a Riemannian uh, manifold uh, uh, compact uh, with uh, positive Ricci. Uh, then uh, it is diffeomorphic to a sphere. or to a quotient of a sphere by some discrete group. Uh, so this is, um, results of this kind are called the sphere theorems in Riemannian geometry. There are, um, they are very important and there are various kinds of results ensuring that some curvature assumption on the, on the manifold implies that the manifold is diffeomorphic or homeomorphic, depending on the cases, to a sphere. Um, but the, um, what was surprising at that time was the technique that Hamilton used. So uh, until that time, uh, results of this kind were not proved using PDEs. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, techniques were, for instance, Morse theory or, uh, or techniques inspired by Morse theory. So the hypothesis on the Ricci curvature was, uh, so no, no, hypothesis on the curvature could be used to study the behavior of geodesics, of the geodesic flow to construct the formations of some parts of the manifold to prove such results. But Hamilton introduced a completely different technique and he acknowledged inspiration by Eels and Samson, but his idea was quite different. He, he said, well, let us take um, this metric and let us evolve by a sort of a heat equation. Heat equation should uh, may average out everything with time. 
So let's hope that it converges to something with constant curvature. And um, since uh, the evolution he found that was the famous Ricci flow preserves positive Ricci, it had to be uh, a metric with constant positive curvature that is a quotient of the sphere. So he somehow constructed a, a continuous deformation from the initial metric to the uh, spherical metric provided by uh, PD. And um, a, a central tool in his analysis was the maximum principle, which will be the topic of this uh, lecture. And, uh, and somehow I think uh, at that time it was um, surprising that someone could um, f prove uh, such differential geometric result basically by using repeatedly and in a clever way the maximum principle. But probably this is also the fasc fascinating things about these flows, uh, intrinsic or extrinsic, that they mix um, analytic and geometric features. Uh, both uh, play a role. And um, let me also mention that, as you probably all know, these ideas were carried uh, further in the following decades. Uh, and Ricci flow has been used to prove uh, uh, so one uh, historical result, that is the Poincaré conjecture, uh, again started by, with a program started by Hamilton and then uh, um, uh, carried to a conclusion by Perelman, and also the differentiable sphere theorem by uh, Simon Brander and Rick Shane. And um, I will, in the next lectures, I will talk more about the, this technique that has been used for the Poincare conjecture because what we will see is a sort of an analog of this technique for the mean curvature flow. But so this is, um, um, I said this because this paper and the later paper by Hamilton on Ricci flow has influenced a line of research on I mean, curvature flow that is uh, after, shortly after this paper by Hamilton, there came a paper by Gerald Huisken uh, on mean curvature flow this time. And the result of this paper was the following, as you know, as a well known result. If, uh, Mn in Rn plus 1 is uh, compact uh, convex uh, hypersurface. And uh, if you consider the mean curvature flow Mnt starting from Mn, then uh, it exists in a finite time interval. with uh, T finite, and as uh, T goes to this um, um, singular time, the, the hypersurface shrinks to a point, and if one performs a rescaling, which keeps, uh, let's say, the area constant, it converges to a round sphere. So it's a sort of extrinsic analog of uh, Hamilton's result. And uh, the proof has uh, um, some analogies and some also some substantial differences with uh, Hamilton's one. But um, in both uh, results, the uh, maximum principle plays an, plays an important role. So, this is just um, so to, to end this uh, introduction, uh, to give some motivation. Um, this is a, a first case where we have, uh, so to say, an analysis of singularities. So typically, 
closed hypersurfaces evolving by curvature flow shrink. Therefore, they become singular in some, in some way. But uh, this case is showing that the singularity is um, not really something bad because it's just a change of scale. If we remain at the same scale, the surface is actually improving from a general convex is going to uh, uh, always the same limit. And um, the purpose of the um, uh, later research is to consider more general initial data, so both in the Ricci flow and in the mean curvature flow, and try to understand what happens in the singularities. One again sees that um, when a singularity is formed, then uh, typically there are only very few possible behaviors. And this allows to say something about the possible initial structure of the, of the manifold. So eventually, in the Ricci flow, this has led to show that uh, uh, dropping the positivity of Ricci and uh, just requiring uh, uh, simply connected, uh, then um, the same conclusion holds without the quotient, of course. And um, we will see a strategy of this kind for the mean curvature flow, where we are able to consider a class of hypersurfaces which is uh, more general than convex, although it has some convexity restriction, and uh, showing that we can do um, mean curvature flow uh, where we continue the flow after singularities using what is called a surgery procedure. And this allows us to say that the initial uh, hypersurfaces had to be a certain structure. So this is the, um, uh, what we are aiming to do. But um, let us start from uh, some uh, uh, one, probably the, the tool that is uh, mostly used in this theory, that is maximum principle. And um, I guess that you you should be familiar with some at least basic version of the maximum principle, so I will not uh, uh, start really from uh, all the details, but, but I would like to, to spend, um, to, to explain in detail also some, uh, something which may be known to many of you, but let me just repeat it. And um, that is, um, um, well, you know that basically mm, maximum principle says that uh, if you have uh, an elliptic equation with some restriction on the zero order term, uh, the, the maximum cannot be attained, uh, elliptic equation on a, in a bounded domain, the maximum cannot be attained uh, in the interior, it, it has to be attained on the boundary. And something similar for parabolic equations uh, the maximum of the solution cannot be attained, so is either attained at the initial time or at the boundary of the domain. We will consider this principle on a manifold, and uh, this, if we consider, as I will do, a compact manifold, this uh, makes the statement easier because uh, in uh, the Euclidean uh, case, uh, either you have uh, all the space, uh, then you have something non-compact which causes uh, some uh, additional difficulty for maximum principle as uh, Toti was uh, recalling this morning, or you have to consider the boundary also. But if we consider a compact manifold without boundary, the statements become uh, particularly easy. Uh, so, I will consider a uh, this, this, let's see. I will consider um, a manifold M, M uh, n-dimensional manifold. G is a metric on the manifold 
which uh, in general depends on time. For our applications, it will uh, usually be the M will be uh, hypersurface evolving by mean curvature flow, and G of T uh, will be the, the metric induced by the immersion at time T. So MN will be uh, compact. Um, then we have um, a Laplace uh, operator induced by the metric. So it's uh, time dependent. When we write it in coordinates, the coefficients will uh, depend on time. I will also, I will always write this way, but you, you have to remember that uh, it, is, uh, it is not a fixed uh, operator uh, like, for instance, in Niels Sampson uh, work, but it is a um, time-dependent operator. Uh, then we consider a solution of um, uh, this parabolic equation. Consider u a function on uh, M uh, on a time interval. Consider a parabolic equation uh, um, that we, we could put more general elliptic operators, but for our purposes, Laplace is enough. Then we can make um, a um, some uh, uh, coefficient, first order. And then um, what I would, uh, it is important for us, uh, let us co also consider a, some um, uh, nonlinear term, f of u. Maybe we can, um, well, let me write it this way. Uh, the same could hold also with the time and space dependence, but we, um, for simplicity, let me write it this way. And um, so what I would like to state is a comparison principle. Um, for a comparison principle, it is useful to, uh, so this is some given function, so, uh, and phi is some uh, smooth in general, possibly nonlinear function. And um, I use the Einstein summation convention, so repeated indices uh, means that we are summing over i. And um, we can also consider the so-called subsolution and supersolutions. So uh, subsolution. Uh, if we consider the u of dt less than or equal to and the super solution if we have uh, greater than or equal to, then we have this statement. So let uh, u U1, U2, respectively, sub-solution and uh, super-solution of the equation, let me call it uh, P, like parabolic, and suppose uh, uh, that uh, at the initial time, the subsolution is less than the super solution. Then the same holds for positive time. And um, well, I'm sure that most of you know the proof, but let me just um, recall how it goes. Um, I I recall the idea um, under, I, I make a stronger assumption, uh, which makes the proof faster. I 
I consider the case where all inequalities are strict. So I will, um, I will write the proof assuming that here we have a strict uh, inequality and we have also a strict inequality here. Then we also have a strict inequality in the conclusion. And um, so how it goes, um, uh, since we assume a strict inequality at time equals zero, um, so suppose uh, We, the conclusion does not hold. For all uh, positive time, then there is a first, uh, um, we can uh, consider the, 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 the supremum, uh, so the, 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 intuitively speaking, the first time where it does not hold. We, so we consider the, the, the time such that uh, uh, the set of all t such that this holds on zero t, and we take the, the supremum, which is not uh, capital T because we are assuming that the uh, theorem is false. Then there is um, uh, uh, first uh, time uh, T star such that uh, uh, U1 uh, uh, of X star T star is equal to U, U2 at P star T star for some P, P star in M. And um, and at that point, we find a contradiction because um, we see that uh, what do we have? We have um, at, uh, so by continuity at that time, we have that u1 is uh, less than or equal to u2 because uh, at all smaller time, we had the strict inequality. So at t star, we have the inequality with less than or equal to. So we have uh, a certain point, uh, possibly others, uh, where u2 is this one, u1 is this one, this is, uh, this is p star. And uh, then um, what do we have? We have that since they are smooth and they are touching, they have the same gradient. Uh, the u1 dxi are equal to du2 over dxi at uh, p star t star uh, for all uh, i. The, the function above has a greater Laplacian, du2, delta u2 is uh, greater than or equal to delta u1. And also, since this is the first time where they touch, it means that u1 is uh, growing rapid, more rapidly than u2. Uh, or uh, that is, we, we have uh, this uh, inequality on the time derivatives at that point. Uh, and finally, since the two functions agree, the, the last term is equal at that point. Phi of u1 is equal to phi of u2. And then you, you find a contradiction because you see that um, uh, the, um, if you compare if you plug all the, the values here, you see that this is in contradiction with the fact that uh, um, having a super solution and a sub solution. From this, uh, you see that um, 
the left hand side uh, is uh, greater than u1, the right hand side uh, is greater for u2, while the um, property of subsolution and super solution says the opposite that uh, that uh, left hand side should be smaller for u1 and uh, than, than for u2 and then you find a contradiction and this uh, argument is immediate because we have assumed uh, strict inequalities at all these places it may look that if we only have uh, non strict inequality then uh, anything uh, that, that we don't find a contradiction because we could have equalities everywhere. But it is possible to do some standard perturbation to replace our true functions with uh, some uh, perturbations that satisfies a strict inequality to argue on the perturbation and then to show that by letting the perturbation go to zero that the original function also satisfies the equality, inequality that uh, it would be in this case non-strict. So um, this, uh, I hope that it was not too easy for you. And um, so let me uh, show a, um, some corollary. Uh, an easy corollary is, um, if uh, phi of zero is equal to z is um, greater than or equal to zero, if we consider the equation like this, uh, and um, u um, um, let's say solution or also super solution of p uh, is uh, greater than or equal to zero at uh, time zero, then uh, uh, u is greater than or equal to zero for all uh, greater times. Because uh, we make a comparison with, uh, with uh, zero. So we, we take u1 equal to zero ident identically, which is of course uh, a solution or a subsolution because of this hypothesis and uh, u2 equal to u. And then we have that uh, u is greater than or equal to 0. And um, an example where we can apply it is uh, the equation of the mean curvature. On, uh, if mt evolves by mean curvature flow, the mean curvature on m satisfies the equation we have seen this morning uh, uh, let me state it in a general Riemannian manifold uh, while uh, most of what I will talk in about in the rest will be in a Euclidean ambient space um, well in this case um, this is not really just a function of u alone. It also depends uh, on, um, uh, can be regarded as a certain uh, suitable function of uh, uh, space and time. Uh, but you can see that the, the same proof works uh, with uh, space and time dependence here. So we can apply this, um, this corollary and uh, show that uh, h uh, greater than or equal to zero is uh, uh, preserved by the flow. So this is uh, one of the convexity properties which is invariant under the flow. And um, a remarkable fact is that uh, this property is invariant also in a Riemannian ambient space. The other properties we will talk about are more uh, sens uh, sensitive to the um, to what is happening in the ambient space. Um, since uh, the, um, the result I've talked about is um, is not a full force uh, of um, 
the maximum principle because there is a well-known other result called the strong maximum principle, which I will just state. Strong, uh, let's say, comparison principle, when it is stated in this way, is um, more commonly called a comparison principle. says that under uh, the same assumption as in the theorem, we have uh, that we have the strict inequality for positive times. Except for the obvious case where the two functions are um, uh, identically the same. So even if the functions are touching uh, somewhere at initial time, they uh, detach immediately. And then uh, we can also say that not only uh, no negative curvature, I mean curvature is preserved, but uh, actually if you start with something which has just no negative mean curvature, it immediately becomes with strictly positive mean curvature. Okay. Um, so let me now give um, some other, some less immediate application. So let us, um, let us consider a function on a manifold which are the restriction of something which is in the ambient space. So consider mt in uh, Rn plus 1 evolving by mean curvature flow. Let us consider some function uh, um, f from uh, Rn plus 1 to R. And we can um, consider a, a restriction on f uh, of f on uh, on mt. Let's call uh, f uh, from uh, um, really as uh, f tilde of uh, Pt is equal to F evaluated as uh, on, on, the, on the point of the immersion. Um, capital F is the immersion of uh, and I want to choose a certain uh, um, suitable function uh, small f, which give me uh, useful information on what, uh, on what our manifold is doing. Uh, for this, it is useful to, since we want to show that this uh, satisfies some parabolic equation, um, it is useful to know, to have a way to compute the Laplace, the Laplace Beltrami of uh, f, uh, on um, restricted on a manifold. So if we have um, um, mt, uh, so f tilde. Sorry, I, uh, yes, actually I, I, yes, you're right, thank you. I, I want to have a um, F which depends on, on the point in ambient space and time. And, um, 
so the um, let me uh, I, I recall your formula for the um, Laplace Beltrami, which is um, let me consider for for a moment the case of a constant f. Well, let me call it. Uh, if, if you have h from rn plus 1 to r, and you have uh, m um, on, uh, in rn plus 1, a hypersurface, then uh, the, um, and you consider h tilde, the h restricted to, to m, then the um, Laplace of h, uh, I put this M to contrast it with the Euclidean Laplace. What's the relation between the two? Uh, well, you have an obvious difference uh, on, uh, in the Laplace Beltrami, you are uh, taking uh, second derivatives only in tangential directions. So you are missing the derivative in the normal direction. So you should uh, take away the, um, should take away the second derivative in the normal direction. But, uh, well, naively one may think this is all the story, but there is an additional term because uh, somehow the fact that um, the surface is uh, bending due to curvature is uh, influencing uh, the, the way the second derivative uh, uh, act. So when you do the second derivative in tangential direction here, you are going straight in the, on, uh, you are moving actually on the tangent plane. When you are computing the second derivative here, you are bending. So there is an additional term which goes this way, which is the mean curvature times uh, the scalar product of the gradient of H in normal direction. Okay, so th this will be useful to make some explicit computation. And um, so in our case, let, let us, uh, so no, we, we will use this formula. Uh, let me make a, um, an easy example. Suppose that our, um, our initial hypersurface, well, we assume that it is compact. Let us take a, a sphere uh, which encloses it. For simplicity, let us assume this is the origin. Let us call R0 the radius. Um, we I will show you that the maximum principle, the scalar maximum principle, gives us an easy way to compare the evolution of this with the evolution of the sphere. That is, let us just define uh, um, f equal to uh, r0 square minus uh, I will call y the point in uh, rn plus 1. Uh, norm of y square minus uh, 2nt. Um, well, let me. Let me put it this way. Let me change signs. Okay. So we have uh, that it is negative uh, at initial time. And uh, our claim is that it remains negative. And uh, how we will show it? We will show by um, computing the um, equation satisfied by it. So df over dt, df tilde, so f tilde 
is uh, uh, defined in that way. So the F tilde over dt has uh, two contributions. Has one contribution just from the time derivative, and then uh, uh, another contribution from here. So it uh, it has um, a let's call it uh, uh, let us denote by d the gradient in the space in the in the space uh, components. So d f times uh, uh, d f d t. So the velocity of the, the point uh, plus df dt. Okay, what, what is the, the gradient of the, this function? The gradient of the function is just uh, uh, two, um, have to put two times y. y is, uh, becomes, uh, is, is the first entry of, uh, of f, so it becomes uh, f. Um, and what's the, um, what's the speed? Uh, this is uh, the mean curvature vector. So mean curvature uh, minus mean curvature times the normal. And then we have uh, dF uh, over dt, which is just minus 2n. Okay, and uh, let us also compute the Laplace of uh, f tilde. So what's Laplace of f tilde? We use this formula here. Uh, the, in, we are in Rn plus one, so the, the Laplace of this expression, so every, uh, it is, we sum n plus one times uh, uh, a two, which comes from the double derivative of a square. So we have two n plus one. Um, and that's it, this does not contribute to the plus, to the plus. Then we have to uh, subtract a second derivative in the normal direction. Well, this uh, again, uh, that doesn't matter which is the normal direction, this will always give a two. And then we have this term. So uh, we have minus h um, times, uh, the gradient of the function, which is uh, the, uh, as before, 2f uh, times nu. Well, if you compare the two expressions, of course, this goes away with, with this. You see that uh, they are just, uh, um, well, they should be the same except for a, uh, Um, well, they should be the same. So I got a sign wrong somewhere. Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, the addition? Yes, sure. Uh, so there's just a plus here, you guess. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I. I mixed up the, yeah, sure, okay. Yeah, uh, I, I made an inconvenient, um, put an inconvenient sign in the definition of f. So let, let's write it this way, then we have a plus, then the, the two things agree, then it just satisfies the heat equation. Um, it satisfies the heat equation, then uh, in particular, uh, zero is also a solution, then uh, by comparison we have uh, f for, um, small, uh, then or equal to zero at positive time, which means that uh, y square is uh, less than or equal to uh, r zero square minus two and t, yes, uh, the, this sign is right, thank you. And uh, which means that um, the, um, this is just the radius of the shrinking sphere, which we have seen this morning. This means that mt remains inside the shrinking sphere. And in particular, this shows that it cannot exist when the right-hand side becomes negative, because we would have a contradiction. 
so this uh, in particular shows that uh, the maximum time of existence is less than um, R0 squared over 2n. And also that uh, for t less than the maximal time of existence, the evolution of our hypersurface is contained in the evolution of the sphere. And um, this apparently implies uh, that this hypersurface shrinks to a point because uh, since the sphere, since uh, uh, the sphere shrinks to a point, it seems that uh, this stays inside the sphere, then it seems that it should also shrink to a point. But you should keep in mind that these properties uh, hold under the assumption that we have a smooth solution. So we only have proved that it stays inside the sphere as long as it stays smooth. It could uh, become non-smooth before shrinking to a point. And uh, so this is a first application. And there is a more sophisticated application where we can show the occurrence of a, a different kind of singularity called the neck pinch. I mean, I told you that uh, Huiskens' result says that every convex hypersurface shrinks to a point. And one could think maybe all uh, hypersurfaces do the same with the mean curvature flow. They shrink to a point. But it's easy to convince ourselves that this is not true. And there was this example that was already conjectured at the beginning of this theory. That is, consider M0 made like this. M0 hypersurface in uh, Rn plus 1 with n greater than or equal to 2. We have here, uh, maybe we can make it longer, a tiny little tube. Um, since uh, this is not a curve, uh, but uh, it has uh, uh, some tiny neck, then it has some big positive curvature. So here, H is uh, very large. Instead, here, H uh, is uh, not large. So intuitively, you expect that for small time, this uh, part of the hypersurface will not move much. Instead, uh, since here the curvature is very large and the radius is very small, it, uh, a small, a tiny amount of time will suffice to make this neck shrink. And so to have the behavior which is um, called the uh, neck pinch. And uh, uh, for some time, this was just a conjecture. Then some rigorous proof came. And in fact, there is a rigorous proof found by Klaus Hecker by a very simple argument, which is just a bit uh, more elaborate than this one. You can take. Um, a function of this form. Oh, I was the definition. Okay. You take this function here. It is uh, possible to show that um, by computation similar to the bit more, bit longer, but similar computations, one can show that uh, it is not really a solution of the heat equation, but it's uh, 
is a sub-solution. So again, if it is um, negative at the initial time, it, it stays negative. Um, what does it mean that it is negative at the... Yes? Yes, this uh, on any mean curvature flow without assumption on the, um, on the hypersurface. Um, we, um, we then can uh, uh, obtain this that if, um, let's consider one as a reference value. If f is smaller than one at uh, time equal to zero, then um, f is smaller than one for time greater than zero. What does it mean, f smaller than one? Um, well, we can, um, this means that if we denote, um, well, we can write it in this way. This means um, y1 square plus y n square, then we have uh, one uh, minus, uh, we have, yeah, minus, uh, okay, this means that this is um, uh, less than one minus t. Well, this is uh, the equation of a hyperboloid. Um, let's, in, um, to fit with that picture, we call n plus one this direction, and uh, all the rest will be the other ones. And you see that for fixed y n plus one, uh, you have something uh, hyperboloid. So th this means that the hypersurface is contained uh, here inside. So this shows that if um, the, the radius of this hyperboloid is um, become smaller and smaller, and when t is equal to one, the hyperboloid becomes a cone. So if you start um, with uh, a hypersurface which is contained inside this hyperboloid with radius one, then it will be still contained inside this hyperboloid. And uh, if on the other hand, you make these two pieces large enough as to contain spheres uh, that uh, shrink uh, to a point in a larger time than uh, zero, uh, uh, than, than one, uh, sorry, then this means that the surface cannot uh, go uh, all on one side or on the other, and then uh, <clears throat> that somehow it has to shrink at uh, this uh, central point before the two other parts have uh, become singular. And um, therefore it shows that there exist solutions that do not become singular by shrinking into a single point. This uh, prevents it. Um, okay, and I, I'm sorry that I was, um, was much slower than expected and because I also wanted to um, say something about um, uh, maybe just let me mention something that I will uh, um, tell in more detail in the next uh, lectures. That is, um, we have, have said that positive mean curvature is invariant under the flow. This is a property which means that the sum of the principal curvature is uh, positive. It is sometimes called the mean convexity. But one 
could be interested in uh, maybe a more uh, common property. What about convexity itself, so that each single curvature is positive? Um, forming curvature flow in Euclidean space, because this property is false for, um, um, uh, is in general not true in a Riemannian ambient space. Um, then convexity is equivalent to Weingarten operator uh, uh, positive uh, semi-definite, and uh, so we do not deal with a single function, we deal with a set of functions. Then there is a maximum principle for uh, uh, tensors, due to Hamilton, which can be applied to the equation satisfied by this, that shows that the, this property is preserved. But well, we have no longer time now, so I will talk about this in the second lecture. So I thank you for your attention.